I'm Kathy Newcomer, and I'm delighted to welcome you to George Washington University's Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration and the Midge Smith Center for Evaluation Effectiveness. I would like to, before we begin the event, we have a special guest that I would like to invite to come up, and that is Midge Smith, for whom the Midge Smith Center for Evaluation Effectiveness is named. She was the founding director of TEI, which is the Evaluators Institute, which others have called the gold standard in evaluation training. And it's my pleasure to actually welcome Midge to this kickoff event for the Midge Smith Center. Midge? Well, I'm very happy <coughs> to be here for this uh, first public event, I believe, Kathy, of the center. And thank you very much for inviting me to come. Um, and I'm happy to welcome all of you here. Um, if I could see some of you, I think I would recognize you, Mark, and some others. <coughs> but before I say much more about that, I'd like to recognize Professor Jed Key. Um, had it not been for Jed, the Evaluators Institute would likely not be here at GW, but at uh, some other place. And Jed also deserves a lot of credit for the center. Um, because it's Jed and I who developed the initial proposal, and then Jed shepherded it through the uh, sometimes arduous uh, GW process. So I'm grateful to Jed for uh, all of his encouragement and support throughout the entire process. So Jed, thank you. And if there's not a something permanent recognition for you, there should be. So thank you. <laughs> Now back to the topic at hand. Uh, <clears throat> the Evaluators Institute has a lot of classes that are relevant for anyone who would like to learn how to do what this August panel here is going to be talking about today. Um, uh, and I had uh, sort of halfway expected to attend some of the classes, and one of them was the, uh, a class by Kavanaugh on financial mapping, which seems really relevant because following the money is an important part of determining what actually happened. And the huge cost is cer certainly the part that we hear, I think, the most, uh, most talked about in jobs. The second class was Dr. Holis that I didn't get to today, Joe, and I thought probably if I went to that that I would learn from you. Is there any evaluation work actually required by any of the agency? Is there any planned? Is there any actually going on? relative to this stimulus package. Now, Kathy gave me a long list of questions that this panel is going to address, and uh, arduous questions. But I'd like to add my last one to that list of things that's considered, and that is, is there really any evaluation work planned or required or going on? Thank you again, Kathy, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Again, I would like to welcome everybody on behalf of both the Trachtenberg School and the Mitch Smith Center for Evaluation Effectiveness. The, the Mitch Smith Center is, has been established to provide thought leadership in evaluation and to promote uh, innovative and creative approaches to improve programs, public, nonprofit programs, and as well as private programs. The, Center is the home for the Evaluators Institute that, as, as I um, indicated, Dr. Smith established in 1995, I believe, and it is now uh, directed by Ann Doucette, who is also one of the faculty members of the Trachtenberg School. And Ann Doucette, I would like to introduce right here and thank her for everything she does. In addition to Jed Key's assistance, the uh, assistance of the Dean of the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences here at George Washington would, was absolutely essential to making all of this happen, and so I would like to publicly thank Dean Peg Barrett for all of her support. And so, here we go. So there's a lot going on besides uh, Supreme Court hearings in town uh, for uh, new members of the court. The stimulus package. So what's, what are we, what's going on? Well, we thought it might be interesting to get the perspectives of a, a very distinguished panel of folks who are 
looking and thinking about um, the accountability and evaluation of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act from a variety of perspectives. And I know that you have seen their bios, and so I am not going to tell you all the wonderful things that these folks have done, because you can read about them in, your, um, in the program. Instead, I just want to give you just a little personal, um, my personal views on, on what these wonderful panelists uh, bring to the, to the table. Hard to know where to start, but uh, Greg Friedman is the Inspector General of the Department of Energy. He is also one of the Inspector Generals that's on the, um, the current uh, Accountability and Transparency Board and has a lot of involvement in the, um, in this, in the AARA now. He has, the, just to give you a little bit of background though, he is a wonderful public servant who started out as a GS-5 and has risen to the top ranks in, in his profession. He was also the um, IG in charge of the president's, um, the PCIE uh, during the last few years. He is um, what, I hope all of our MPA and MPP students uh, strive to become the absolute best and possible of a public servant that makes me very proud to, uh, to call him my friend. I've known him for, I've known several of the people on this board for about, on this panel for about 25 years. Nancy Kingsbury is providing the GAO perspective. I like to call her sort of the chief methodologist of the, uh, of the GAO, because she's in charge of all of those, the statisticians and the social scientists that make sure there's rigor in GAO, GAO work. But what you might not know is, as I have known Nancy Kingsbury, is been one of the pioneers in making the evaluation profession a profession. She was one of the key movers behind establishing the association. The American Evaluation Association was run out of her house for like 10 years. So she has been a very active in evaluation behind the scenes as well as at GAO. Joe Holy, he is, really needs no introduction. He is one of the key uh, leading thought leaders in the evaluation field. He is the person who was back working in evaluation in the Califano um, HEW, was head of evaluation then, has written many books, is as, as viewed as one of the key thought leaders in terms of pointing evaluation towards program improvement, and is one of the leading experts in our country on the role of evaluation in the federal government. So it's a pleasure to, to have Joe here. At the end, Brian Segrets is actually one of our alumni of the Trachtenberg School, but that's not why he's here. I just want to say that up front. I'm very proud to, uh, of what he's accomplished. But he's here because he works at the, the uh, National Association of State Budget Officers, and he's the guy that actually runs around and talks to briefs, um, uh, consults with budget offices of, of the states, and they are particularly interested in this topic. And so we couldn't fly 50 of them in, but we have Brian instead to provide this perspective from the, the state level. And then lastly, I'd like to introduce one of my most recent uh, colleagues in the, in, uh, in the Trachtenberg School as well as the Elliott School. We thought we needed a rocket scientist to, to deal with this issue, so we got one because this is a thorny issue. Uh, Scott Pace is a faculty member here and the director of the Space Policy Institute, but more importantly, he's coming because he is the former performance improvement officer at NASA. And before I met him when he joined GW, I heard about him when I was interviewing a lot of the, per the uh, performance improvement officers as part of a research project that I had undertaken about a year ago. And I said, which, which of these guys should I talk to? And all these people said, you gotta talk to, to Scott because he, he's the guy that knows in terms, and so he has very recently been dealing from the, eight, the executive agency um, perspective on performance. And that, again, is, is what we're really focusing on tonight, is, is performance. The performance of all the entities that are gonna be utilizing uh, millions of our dollars to try to stimulate the economy. I'm going to start with some questions that I, that I will be addressing to the panelists, and then we will be opening the, um, the discussion to you all. So start thinking of the questions that you would like to, to bring. So I'm going to start out with, with a uh, 
the question that's really the, uh, the theme tonight. But that is, what role does improving government performance play in the current stimulus effort? So what role is improving government performance playing? I'm going to ask Greg to start. Well, first, <clears throat> um, one of my sons, who is a very accomplished speaker, told me that if I was nervous, I should look out in the audience and uh, picture everybody without clothes on. It happens with the lights here, it's very difficult to see you, so uh, it, hopefully it will reduce the anxiety. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kathy for uh, inviting me, thank the Trachtenberg School and the, and the Smith uh, Center. I think it's really important that forums such as this take place, and, and I'm very pleased to be with such an august uh, group of uh, panelists. In the, uh, second, in the First World War, actually, the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, came before the British cabinet and said, gentlemen, uh, I unfortunately have to inform you that we are out of money. Now we're going to have to think. <laughs> well, uh, I would extrapolate from that to uh, the Stimulus Act and say, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I regret to inform you we have massive amounts of money, and now we are going to have to think. Uh, I think, frankly, in response to, uh, to Dr. Newcomer's question, that if we don't uh, both those of us in the private sector, those of us in the public sector, both at all levels of government, don't use this unique opportunity to improve government, to make uh, uh, techniques and mechanics such as program evaluation a permanent part of what we do of our portfolio, we will have missed an opportunity uh, of a lifetime. And I really hope that that does not uh, take place. I hope that we aggressively learn lessons from this experience we have to uh, reconcile the, uh, the notion of expediency, that is, get the money out for the stimulative effect, and the notion of, of uh, accountability. And I suspect no piece of legislation that I am aware of, and I've been in government uh, now 42 years, has had the imprimatur of the, the president and the vice president, and the bill itself, the, the legislative uh, action itself, focus on the question of uh, enhancing transparency and accountability. So I think there is a genuine opportunity for us to use this not as an ending point, but as a beginning point, to bring about permanent changes in the way government goes about spending the taxpayers' money, improving government performance, institutionalizing tools such as program evaluation to the extent that it has not been institutionalized, and over the long run, hopefully, we will improve government performance. Okay, some introductory remarks, Nancy. Um, thanks. I, I do um, both come from a long history in the program evaluation field more than I want to particularly talk about here, but um, the perspective that that has given me is the, to watch the cycles of interest in program evaluation, at least at the federal level, and it is clear almost independently of the Stimulus Act that there is a um, full employment act for evaluators pending in this administration that is going to go beyond the stimulus act. That said, GAO is in not exactly a unique position. I think the IGs and, and others, the, the accountability thread in the stimulus act is um, borders on uh, overwhelming. Uh, there is a clear uh, expectation that we will be, we not just GAO, GAO, the IGs, the state auditors, the local auditors, everybody will be following the money and trying to figure out whether something is happening to the benefit of the American people. Um, it is a huge challenge. In the act itself, GAO has 13 statutory mandates, um, the first of which was appointing a committee to look at the health IT thing, uh, the second of which was a short report on um, some regulations SBA was supposed to issue. The third and continuing and almost overwhelming task is the requirement to report every 60 days on what's going on in quote unquote selected states and localities which we have defined as 17 sta 16 states in the District of Columbia. And one of the things that I'm really amazed about GAO for an institution that's been around for 77 years, in a matter of three weeks after that bill was passed, we turned on a dime pulled together state teams numbering five, six, seven people each, programmatic teams numbering some other numbers of people each, a matrix environment, a tool up on the web to collect information, and we put people in the field three weeks later. 
Um, we issued our first 60-day report on time. It was 400 and some pages if you printed it all. We issued our second 60-day report last week. It was 800 and some pages if you printed it all. And we can't keep this up. We are finally having to stop to think. And I really like that theme. We've got to stop to think. It is nuts for us to go out there and try to do this level of work in all of those states. And by the way, we're also monitoring the other 30-some states um, on a more superficial level. Um, part of the difficulty that we have is that everybody wants answers now. They want evaluation now. And I don't know that you all can see this, but this is a little chart. And you can see this bar, which is this year, is sort of low. And this bar, which is that year, is sort of high. All that money is going out next year, not this year. And so the expectation that anybody, the best evaluator in the world, Joe Holy, anybody else, can actually do very much between now and the end of next year is part of our job is educating the Congress that we're not going to get there from here. We've got to give this a little bit of time. The other thing, another one of our mandates, and one we're beginning to turn our attention to, is that we are supposed to comment on the recipient reports. You all are probably familiar with the fact that all of the recipients of this money uh, is suppo are supposed to report to a website, which, as Greg was telling me a few minutes ago, is not exactly up and running yet. Um, and we know it's not either. It, won't, it doesn't even get its first data until October. Um, we're supposed to comment on this data that's being reported from all the recipients. The agencies are also supposed to be looking at the data what's going out, what's coming back. We don't know what's going to be out there, but we're trying very hard not to be in the position of just issuing a report every quarter. Those are quarterly reports we have to issue that says there's a lot of problems with these data. Because there's going to be a lot of problems with these data, at least in the short term. Um, so we're trying to educate the Congress about what it's going to take. The final thing I'll just uh, comment about, about the evaluation function here, is one of the major goals of the act is to create or retain jobs. We are having trouble with our own staff. Explain, we're having to explain to our own staff how you can start watching job creation at the same time unemployment is going up. Okay? It's, a, it's a bit of a dilemma. Um, and we're going to try to do that in the testimony uh, next week. Every single expert that we've talked to, and we've talked to a lot, have pointed out, and we, my own folks who, who do this for a living say the same thing, it is going to be hugely difficult and probably impossible to make a direct causal connection between all of this money and jobs being created because we don't know the counterfactual. We will never know what the economy would have done if we hadn't done this. So our approach to this is to try to do some uh, state-level modeling of the status of economies in the states and put these job numbers, whatever comes in to recovery.gov in the, in the near future, in the context of what's going on in that individual state and hoping we can tell the story about it from there. So I'll let it go with that. Thank you for the, for the uh, view from GIO. Well, let's go to the view from the states for some introductory remarks from Brian. Um, from the state perspective, this definitely has been interesting times uh, for the past year or so. The one thing uh, I think it's definitely sure about the stimulus, the stimulus, the, is, it's the funding stimulus is very timely for states. Uh, some other past stimulus efforts have kind of come after states have been in a downturn for a while. This one hit pretty much at the right time for states. Uh, fiscal 2009, which states just ended on June 30th, uh, and states are just getting into fiscal 2010. Fiscal 2009 was kind of a turning point for states uh, by a lot of standards. We saw negative state spending in fiscal 2009 of 2.2%, and fiscal 2010 is supposed to be negative by 2.5%. This will be the first time that we've been tracking the data where you've had negative state spending two years in a row. Um, another thing we saw is 42 states had to cut their budgets mid-year in fiscal 2009, which is also the highest number we've ever seen for a total of about $31 billion. Basically, this is all coming because the revenue has completely fallen off the table for states. Uh, the interesting thing about this downturn compared to some previous downturns is revenue is kind of dropping in all the major sources right now. Personal income tax, sales, corporate, uh, even some of the smaller forms of taxes. Even after 9-11, you saw most of the drop off is in personal income taxes for states. Right now, states are filling in all their different sources. So it's leading towards huge shortfalls for states. Um, 
think the last time we did an estimate, it was about $230 billion of shortfalls between fiscal 2009 and fiscal 2011. That includes shortfalls already closed and current ones. So the stimulus is definitely very needed. Uh, the stimulus is starting to have some effect in states. The money's just starting to get out there towards states and everything. So it's really kind of early in the process in some, some levels for states, but in other ways it's very timely to be discussing some of these sort of issues. Right now, states are really dealing with all the reporting requirements and everything, trying to figure out how exactly the data will be reported. Um, as Nancy, I believe, mentioned, October will be the time when states first start reporting the data. Um, October 1st, period between October 1st and October 10th, the data will be reported, then it will be adjusted and everything. So it's the first time you're really going to see the data and everything. So states are trying to figure out how exactly to report that to the federalreporting.gov website that's been set up, what means, what all needs to be reported, uh, figuring out all the different transparency requirements and everything with it. The kind of interesting thing so far, I think, is there's been a lot of collaboration between state groups and everything. Um, our association, the state budget officers, have been working closely with the Association of State Auditors, Comptrollers, and Treasurers, Association of State Legislators, so National Governors Association. So you're seeing a lot of partnership going on right now, trying to figure out all these different requirements, because the requirements in a lot of ways are kind of unprecedented. And the other thing, we're really seeing a good partnership between the states and the federal government at this point. Um, both OMB and GAO have been very receptive to any questions we've given them. Uh, we're having weekly conference calls right now with both, both, both OMB and GAO and the state groups and everything, trying to get worked through some of these issues. Uh, a lot of times it seems when you get one answered question, one question answered, you have two or three other questions kind of arise. But I mean, I think we are making progress in trying to figure out some of these sort of things. But um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting process going forward here. And uh, uh, you know, as we move closer towards October, um, that's going to be the big time for states to try to see, you know, once they actually submit the data and the valuation, it'll be the first time we'll really be able to report all the numbers. Thank you, Brian. Joe? Well, I looked at the reporting requirements under the statute. Unfortunately, my printer ran out of ink at a certain <laughs> point, but that was fortunate, too. Uh, it's a very long statute. Uh, uh, so what impresses me so far is uh, there's a lot of... Uh, requirement for transparency, accountability at the micro, micro, micro level. Uh, that's fine. Uh, that's not evaluation. Everything's evaluation in one sense. But uh, this reminds me, Robert Kennedy was enthused about evaluation, and he got a little thing put into the Elementary and Secondary Education Act that every project had to be evaluated every year. Uh, and this is even at a more micro level than that. So. You're chewing up lots and lots and lots of uh, analytical talent uh, if you have to stick to these procedures, and especially if people are agonizing over the data being wrong. Uh, you know, uh, no data system is right. You know, you can you can try to do better, try to measure better, but uh, we're we're in a situation, I think where there's a danger of uh, losing bigger pictures. Uh, I, I do not think. First of all, I know there's going to be a lot of waste in this program. They're putting money out there and saturating people on, say, some of this uh, winterize your home stuff, where the people are getting, you know, like a, a I'll just make up a number out of my head here, a 10,000% increase uh, in what they're used to getting, or an infinite increase. Uh, so they're not set up to manage the money well. So I, I know that already, and in some program areas, things are going to go very poorly. On the other hand, affordable housing in this country was dead in the water. And now you have the Stimulus Act, and all of a sudden, you're able to build housing for low and moderate income people that you never would have had uh, before. So it's this, And then here's Ron Kirby. He's been dreaming for 10,000 years. Uh, he's over the Council of Governments, that you can move people by fast buses on uh, express lanes at, you know, one one-hundredth of the cost of trying to build these rail systems. And all of a sudden, people in a serious way are saying, we could have busways, as they do in some metropolitan areas, running here, there, and everywhere. And I know, if they ever pull it off, that that will be an impact, a causal impact of this 
you know, you throw a whole lot of money out there, you're bound to cause a few good things. I know we'll cause a lot of bad things, too. But it will be possible if we look in sort of a sampling way to figure out some impacts, as I say, some good, some bad. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Scott. Okay. Um, well, I'm not a professional uh, performance evaluator. I got, uh, I got dragged into this. Um, uh, when uh, I came, went to work for uh, Sean O'Keefe, who was the president's, who was one of the authors of the president's management agendas in the last uh, administration, and focused on a few areas of things like financial management and competitive sourcing, budget performance integration, uh, human capital, and, and IT sorts of things. And uh, those were a sort of a limited target set uh, that we were to work with. And uh, when I look at the um, uh, the stimulus uh, issues that are going on right now, uh, I'm very struck by the, uh, the comments uh, that other panelists have made uh, because there's an inherent tension in what we're asking the stimulus you know, to do. On one hand, there's a political imperative uh, to show a response to, uh, to a very bad economy and to stimulate uh, employment. Uh, and therefore an attention to obligations and outlays and job creation and, uh, and of course, the attention that uh, is given to evaluating um, every, every tick of potential job creation is sort of reminiscent of, you know, pulling up the carrots every few weeks to see how they're doing. Um, <laughs> the, the problem is, is there is, as everyone has said, there is a lag time uh, in these processes. Uh, and as a result, and this is particularly true for an R&D agency, uh, but I'll go on about uh, NASA, which has its own issues of evaluating performance and such. Uh, and therefore, given that kind of lag time, um, what we probably ought to be focused on, what agencies ought to be focused on, is long-term performance improvement, using the slug of money, uh, moving through the system, uh, kind of a bit like a gully washer, uh, and to use that as an opportunity to make the systems uh, work more smoothly, to get more good outcomes, as uh, Joe mentioned, and fewer, fewer bad outcomes. Uh, the problem is the pressures uh, for reporting and the, uh, the kind of the, the hurry up and uh, not really having an opportunity to think uh, work exactly counter uh, to that, uh, that desire for longer term performance improvement. And that in turn erodes the kind of trust and partnership that you need to have with the career staff who are going to be around there for a long time. And they're the ones who are going to embed performance changes and improvements long after a particular political leadership uh, uh, goes away. Uh, so, uh, you know, the saying that, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, well, from a, I think from a career staff uh, standpoint, you know, a large slug of money is actually too important also to waste and to be, and to rush about it. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, one of the things that we should be um, uh, talking about is what are some of the longer term changes that can be done? How can the transaction costs of some of the accountability requirements that are coming in here uh, be removed? Some of the uh, folks here are closer to it than me can comment, but one of the requirements in the Recovery Act uh, essentially means no commingling of funds. That is that the stimulus money is its own special thing to be watched in its own special way as it courses through. Well, this is sort of you know, like maybe watching some colored dye make its way through the Mississippi River. Um, you know, you can do it if you watch really closely, uh, but it's hard to do. And so um, uh, that uh, political desire for accountability and transparency, which sounds very reasonable and, and, uh, and very uh, responsible, uh, also works counter uh, to taking the time and thoughtful effort necessary uh, to improve your programs uh, in the longer term, precisely because you're treating it as a separate and special activity rather than as a pilot effort for improving mission effectiveness for the agencies in the long term. Thank you, Scott. So we have some great challenges before us. As you look uh, over the federal government, uh, my next question for you all is, uh, in which federal uh, agencies and perhaps which federal program areas do you see the best prospects for actually detecting the impact of um, the Recovery Act funding, for example, on federal outputs on state and local activities, um, longer-term outcomes. Nancy, what would you say? Well, I, it's clear to us, although we haven't, we're only beginning to focus on how to look at this in the longer term, because again, the money is not going to be out there until next year. There clearly are some discrete program areas um, that over some time we should be able to get our arms around and see whether 
uh, it's having an appropriate effect. In the short term, take the education uh, money that's going out. In the short term, what appears to be happening, as best we've been able to see in the early days, um, is we're avoiding further calamitous um, problems in the, in the K through 12 education system and pe teachers that would have been fired aren't being fired and, and so forth. And that's, that's an important short-term goal. But if you read the act carefully, there's clearly an intention to use some of this money for education reform. It's gonna take a while for the program to get to a point where we could evaluate whether that kind of thing was happening. Uh, but clearly that's one of the areas we're watching. Uh, the, the housing programs that, that Joe mentioned are another area where we're going to be able to figure out in due time, um, again, most of the money goes out next year, not this year, um, whether we are making a dent in affordable housing and whether this has helped. That will be related to job creation, but it won't certainly be the only, um, only part of that. Uh, so as we, and there's other areas, um, the, the, uh, the transit areas, the weatherization, the problem with the weatherization program is that from a federal point of view, um, I think that program has been plussed up by 10 or 20 times. Uh, so whether there's even the capacity to develop an evaluation plan for that is something that we're um, certainly gonna look at in the short term. Um, it's a bit overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, the, mon the amount of money is unprecedented. Uh, I think there are targets of opportunity out there. I come back to the basic question of job creation, job retention, whether we'll ever be able to do a definitive evaluation of that goal of the act, I think remains to be seen, but we'll just have to take our time and see. Greg? Well, <clears throat> I feel like I'm caught in the crossfire because the program actually that, that I was going to advocate as one where uh, program evaluation is possible is the weatherization program, mm -hmm. one that I know quite well. So it's been criticized. Uh, to my left and criticized to my right. So that puts me in the unique position of defending the indefensible. Um, <laughs> you know actually, there are problems Actually, too. I think there are shovel rate, there are aspects of, of this. This is, this is an $800 uh, billion, dollar, B billion dollar uh, elephant in, in the room. In the Department of Energy's parlance, we have approximately a $27 billion a year budget. We receive $40 billion in supplemental funding and $125 billion in loan and loan guarantee authority. So it gives you some perspective. And I might point out uh, uh, that uh, the framework of this program was done with very few political officers in place. It was done in the very early parts of the, of the Obama administration. And this is not criticism. It's, it's the way this process works. It's, it was the nature of the, of the crisis, economic crisis that we faced. It was the nature of trying to get a stimulus, a stimulus package uh, together. And as a consequence, uh, the, the, the careerists were, were deeply involved in doing things that infrequently uh, political officers should be doing. But weatherization is an example, I think, of a, of a, of a shovel-ready program where at the end of the day, we will have quite a bit of success in, in evaluating the, the, the success of, of, the, of the program. We will be able to determine whether the homes of, of poor people in this country have in fact been weatherized, whether they're electric, and their heating bills and their air conditioning bills have, have gone down, whether their energy use has been reduced, whether contractors were employed and, 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 and uh, jobs created. So I think there are some, and, and this is only one example, I think there are others. It's not gonna be easy, there's no question about it, and the demand for uh, evaluators and, and auditors, frankly, is, is, is overwhelming at the state, local, and federal uh, levels. But I think it can be done, and I think there are certainly strong, large components of this $800 billion elephant where we can be quite successful, quite effective at evaluating ultimately the performance of the program. Joe? I had thought that uh, a good strategy, and it could be in that area and other areas too, in various program areas, you do uh, stratified sampling. and. Uh, but you got so much going on out there, you could uh, afford to have pretty thin samples and you'd still have a lot. Uh, and you do uh, case studies using both quantitative and qualitative methods to get a handle on what's happening in hundreds of projects uh, that would, ca would give you a picture of uh, what's happening in the country if you did your stratified random sampling instead of doing other sampling strategies. Uh, you could really know, and uh, case studies are like little stories of what happened. Here's how things were before they got started. 
uh, things were all going to hell, we were going to fire half the teachers, et cetera. And then, lo and behold, we only laid off uh, one janitor in that school, and education continued. You know, it would be, and, and you could have, uh, in principle, as many of these cases as you wanted. And if you did it in a uh, sophisticated sampling way, it would add up. If people didn't believe you, you'd say, do you want a 1% sample instead of a tenth of 1%? I mean, there's so much out there that you could learn a lot with as what I was calling thin samples. And I would do it, you know, my strategy would be to go program area by program area. I don't say that, not a, that there won't be a lot of good things done with the money. There always will be good things done with any money. And the question is, uh, I think the administration's scared to death about waste. Well, the way it's being run, money's going to be wasted all over the place. You know, I, I can tell already. That's not to say it's a bad thing to do. Uh, we're in crisis. And, uh, but one of the objectives, you know, to, to modernize the transportation infrastructure of the country, and they're going to have people out there filling potholes because they can do it fast. Uh, there's a little tension there. <laughs> So we know that there's going to be lots and lots of data coming in. What are, what are we going to use the data for? What, what do you think might, will be the most important uses of uh, the data in terms of getting learning, learning, accountability, enlightenment, improving government performance and effectiveness? So your thoughts. Um, Greg? Well, uh, frankly, I, I, this is perhaps a cheap answer, but I think all, all, of, all of the above. And uh, we are spending, uh, as really has been described. Uh, I, I am on the Recovery Act board with uh, 11 or 12 of my uh, colleagues in the IG community, and we have uh, received the unenviable task of running recovery.gov. Uh, I can't think of 12 people less well-equipped to run a massive information system than 12 IGs. Uh, I guess we, we could have had 14 IGs on the panel, then we, w we would have split, spread the wealth uh, somewhat. We're, we're really ill-equipped to, to do this. And the big rush of the data begins in October of, uh, of this year. And, um, and frankly, you know, if you hear the people, the theoreticians talk about it, it will, what we intend to have at some point anyhow is a, a system in which an individual in a small town will be able to use one of these interactive uh, screens on his or her computer, accessrecovery.gov, press their state, press their county, press their town, and they'll see how, much, how many potholes were, were filled, um, as has been described. And then they will know that it was the, the brother of the mayor who filled all the potholes and made all the money, and then they will turn them in to the IGs, and hallelujah, <laughs> we, will, we will cure the world's ills. Um, so I think, but I, I, I do think, I, I, I'm hopeful that it, we don't get down to that point. I think we will probably, but I, I'm not sure that'll be all that beneficial. But I think in general, uh, the American people will be well served, I hope they'll be well served, by a, a fair amount of information available to them so that they can at least have some level of confidence, and I hope this will instill confidence, that uh, their representatives, both the, the political representatives and the career representatives, are actually doing their business and, and uh, shepherding their money uh, effectively. Brian, what do you think about the most important uses of all these data? Um, I think, to start off with, most of the data is going to be used just for accountability issues. Um, states, I mean, are required to, you know, so many requirements built into the Recovery Act uh, that you're really going to be starting off with just strictly accountability and trying to comply with it, uh, you know, dealing with the recovery boards looking at you, dealing with GAO, dealing with all the other groups and everything. There's a lot of political pressure for governors and for states to make sure they spend the money correctly and try to limit waste as much as possible. Um, obviously, there's going to be some degree of waste, but really trying to minimize that. So states are really focused right now mainly on the accountability side. I think as you know, the Recovery Act carries on for the next two or three years, you're going to move a little bit more towards trying to measure the effectiveness of it. Um, some states are requiring their state agencies to submit additional information on top of what's being required by the federal government, and the states are going to use that for their own purposes, kind of evaluate the programs in greater detail and everything. And I think, too, to a certain degree, it kind of depends what, what program you're looking at of what the possible benefits and could be of it. Uh, for example, something like the increased Medicaid money, I think there is just going to be strictly more accountability because, I mean, the Medicaid money is basically going to 
try to make sure that states at least maintain the services and everything, not necessarily to do an overhaul of Medicaid or really change the way it's done. But some of the other programs might lead to greater government effectiveness. Um, the health IT, the broadband, some of those things that are a little bit more long-term, I think you could see start to contribute to you know, a greater level of effectiveness down the road. Scott, what do you think? I think people are, are I don't know if the folks who are on the front line probably appreciate it, but I think the American public doesn't quite appreciate how much back office work has to go on. Uh, I mean, things are really being done by folks using Excel. I mean, that's, that's what's there now. I mean, the, 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 the picture of, uh, that uh, was mentioned about being able to figure out how many potholes, um, in some ways I think that's a pernicious influence of Google. You know, you're used to going in and you type a question or something and boom, an answer comes up. And, and you're sort of almost trained to kind of respond, well, that's how easy answers should be. It should be free, it should be cheap, it should be sort of good, and uh, I should uh, be able to get it instantly on my computer. Um, there's no appreciation for the amount of back office work that, that has to go on to making uh, something like that, that happen. And so I think a focus on agency uh, mission performance uh, should be probably the A number one issue. And if I could, I realize it's politically probably impractical, uh, but if, if I could uh, wave a wand for any of the agencies, I would, I would really say focus on executing your jobs. Focus on mission performance. Pay no attention to those phone calls from the White House and OMB asking what your odds and outlays were this week. Be nice to the IG and be nice to the GAO people because you're going to have to deal with them for a long period of time. <laughs> but laser-like focus on agency performance and uh, buy time to put in back office systems, put in IT systems, train people you know, up to speed so that you've got something that's really worthwhile after this particular you know, uh, uh, thunderstorm washes past. Um, I think that uh, right now we, we're taking in, we're burning out a lot of people uh, answering an immediate problem, uh, you know, trying to just stay afloat and not really paying attention to the stuff in the back office. It's very unsexy, very boring, and in fact, most of the time when you tell people what you're doing, they say, haven't you done that already? Um, so using the time now to, uh, to make those longer term fixes uh, and keeping other folks at bay um, would, be, uh, would be one of my wishes. Joe? Yeah, I think, uh, of course, I want the major purpose always of evaluation to be improvement. And uh, in a sinking, uh, with a sinking heart, I say, I think the major purpose is going to be uh, enlightenment, transparency, at the most accountability, and uh, that's too bad. But uh, since there's so much out there and there has to be some administrative overhead, it's occurring to me sitting here that it might be possible to you know, grab a little bit of it to uh, help the agency perform better. Uh, you need some overhead, and you can probably hire some um, couple of extra analytical people somewhere along the line Analytical talent's very scarce, and it's sort of too bad. Uh, I like it very much, uh, looking at it um, not at the project level. This, these requirements tend to look at the project level, and uh, that's just the wrong level. And so I like the idea of trying to say, you know, can we, in the midst of all this flurry, can we try to see uh, things that would uh, improve our regular programs? Uh, both Rhode Island centers, I'm in Rhode Island right now, I'm not here, and I just happened to be down here this week, uh, but they know we need another stimulus, and uh, the world knows we're not going to get it. And that means this country is going to be like a basket, not a basket case, it's a very rich country, but it's going to be in terrible shape for years to come. And if you think of the nonprofit sector, blood is going to be all over the place, Programs are going to be dying. Nonprofits are going to be dying. And so the country's going to be transformed in a sort of negative way, even beyond what happens to government. Uh, President Reagan thought government was the problem. Uh, we need government for certain things. And uh, we sort of found it out when this big crisis came. And now uh, we'll find out that government didn't help as much as it could have. Uh, because we didn't go at it in a thoughtful way. Uh, a stupid statute was written. It's going to waste a lot of the money in the sense of opportunity cost. I don't say that the individual projects won't do some good. I wouldn't m even mind stipulating, suppose each one of them did some good. But you could have done so much better. 
if you just think of the high-speed rail as something that could have been done, you could have had at least a few lines that would uh, make the country understand that, you know, government can really help you sometimes and uh, do things that you thought were impossible. When one of the freeways, one of them, when several of them fell down in uh, L.A., uh, you couldn't believe how fast they were rebuilt. So big things can be done fast. It doesn't need to take 10 years to do this and 10 years to do that. But you'd have to aggregate the resources. Uh, so maybe you could say, I've heard of the possibility of amendments. You know, it has happened uh, in the history of uh, government here. And if you use the, uh, this uh, first year evaluation period, where, as Nancy says, not all the money is going to be spent, and uh, a lot of it's going to be still to be spent in years two and three, and if you look at that education reform stuff, probably years four, five, six, whatever. So, so maybe uh, you could get some uh, understanding that there is a big opportunity cost here, and we could uh, perhaps, uh, if allowed to, uh, redirect some of it to better effect, maybe romantic. Well, speaking of timing, so since uh, intentionally you have limited um, bursts of uh, funding for this, do you think there's going to be a longer term effect on things, for example, uh, our research and development and, and innovation? Um, how do you see that playing out with short, the short term funding? How is it going, it's going to yield longer term uh, effects in areas such as that? Scott, what would you say? Um, I think the answer is, is, is probably uh, probably minimal. Um, just as you uh, really can't create, I believe, long-term jobs with one-year money, um, I don't think that you can really execute longer-term R&D effects uh, without, uh, with also with this kind of short uh, stimulus uh, kind of money. Uh, it just doesn't lend itself that way. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do useful things. Um, you know, for example, NASA has a lot of buildings. A lot of them are actually fairly, uh, fairly old. Uh, you know, built during the Apollo program and the 40s and so forth. And going on a uh, major, uh, you know, teardown and energy efficiency drive in, among federal buildings generally, and say NASA in particular, uh, reduce carbon footprint, uh, be able to uh, have energy efficiencies. Uh, those are things that would have long-term uh, sorts of benefits. Just as you know, patching the roads and avoiding problems in schools there are ways to make. I think with short-term money to make the federal enterprise uh, somewhat more effective. Uh, but again, the time lags uh, that you uh, see uh, on research and the difficulty of uh, g doing longer-term employment with, uh, with, with one-year monies, I think makes the R&D agencies almost somewhat of an outlier uh, for that. Uh, that's where, that's again maybe another reason why I'm biased uh, toward uh, uh, making longer-term uh, investments in improving agency performance and maybe using stimulus monies for sort of cost avoidance and uh, uh, and repairing things that have been deferred for too long. Brian, your thoughts? Um, I think there's a chance there'll be some innovation and, you know, R&D developments coming from the stimulus. I guess you got to remember what the intention was for the stimulus overall, while some of it was directed more towards the innovation. I mean, a lot of it was designed to be counter-cyclical funds going down to the states and everything, uh, kind of provide budget stability, you know, like was mentioned, to prevent some of the layoffs of schools, uh, to be able to maintain education. Uh, be able to maintain Medicaid funding and try to prevent some of the really draconian cuts going on in states. So, I mean, that was really one of the major goals of the stimulus and everything to try to, you know, get the economy going again and everything. But I think some of the other programs, it's going to take some time, but it may lead to some innovation and some longer term change. Um, I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic about some of the things like the high speed rail or the broadband. I mean, High speed rail, there's not enough money in the Stimulus Act to completely change, you know, they completely do an overhaul of high speed for every project that wants funding across the country. But it is a start in some of those things. It could start to change our transportation system a little bit. And even some of the other transportation dollars, I mean, even if this is just paving a road or some of the other minor projects, I mean, it's probably not going to be too many Golden Gate bridges built from the stimulus dollars or anything, but some of the other transportation dollars, I mean, I guess you have to define what longer term it is. I mean, if it is five or ten years, you know, the road's going to give benefits or some other projects and everything. I mean, I think you're going to see benefits extend for the stimulus past the two or three year period where the stimulus is going to be, you know, the majority of the funding is going to be taking place. Many of you have pointed out the, oh, Greg. Uh, 
Uh, I just wanted to point out, and, and the problem, uh, it's difficult to generalize about the, the, the Recovery Act because there are so many different components and you really have to look all, at all of them in a sense uh, separately. And the generalized uh, view about whether or not they will, there will be a long-term impact I think uh, is somewhat risky. And of course I, I know more about the Department of Energy than I do about the stimulus package uh, and, it, and its impact on the Department of Energy and the Department of Energy programs than I do about government in, in general, obviously. Uh, clearly, to, to stimulate the economy, we could have hired uh, blimps and dropped money out of, the, uh, out of the sky over the beaches of uh, the Jersey coast in Florida, and that would have had a stimulative uh, effect to, to some degree. Maybe it would have been, actually, the programs would have been more effective than, uh, than what we're doing. But, but I pointed out earlier, at least I attempted to, the Department of Energy, we have uh, 100 billion or 125 billion in loan guarantee authority. Now, elections have consequences and uh, budgets and policy expenditure, uh, excuse me, uh, funding expenditures are implementations of those, of those policies uh, that come out of the elections and, and the different philosophies. And clearly at the Department of Energy, if this $125 billion in loan guarantees uh, for innovative uh, energy technologies, uh, solar, wind, uh, biofuels, and uh, all the rest. If, in fact, it works, and if we create the kinds of partnerships that are envisioned with the private sector and, and, and help them obtain the capital they need to pursue uh, their goals, there will be, at least in this sector, uh, a long-term, potential long-term impact to the Stimulus uh, Act, which I think will be extremely important uh, on many levels. Uh, job creation, green jobs, certainly. Uh, carbon footprint change, absolutely. Energy independence, real potential. So I think there are some, there are some positive aspects that, that we shouldn't uh, overlook, at least potential positive aspects. I got the idea in, uh, just by talking to some of the students there in this, these courses uh, that we've been doing this week, uh, the Evaluators Institute, uh, that um, at some of the basic research, uh, well, I'm thinking of uh, NIH in particular, so rather than talk around it, uh, what the, there would be a job creation effect in that they'd go further down uh, the list of those uh, projects. They would have not funded that young researcher, perhaps, uh, and uh, his or her graduate students, and, all, and now they will. Uh, but that's not going to uh, necessarily be path-breaking. There's been a criticism of NIH, that, uh, especially NCI, which is one of the bigger pieces, that it's not very bold and, and uh, not too, doesn't take too many risks in, in what it's been funding. I don't think that they're going to dramatically change because there's no time to do it uh, this, you know, in this little window here. Uh, I think the effect will be that they, uh, they fund more projects. Uh, more people will be employed, that's true, uh, but I don't think it's going to have a big long-term effect on biomedical research. We've been talking about all the rec reporting requirements. There's a lot, lots and lots of reporting requirements. Do, do we have any estimation of how, what proportion of the total costs will actually go to reporting? Nancy? Um, well, there's, there's upfront costs for monitoring the reporting. I mean, there's a fair amount of money that's been given to the IG community to do that, a uh, somewhat smaller amount of money that's been giving, given to GAO to do that at least over the next year and a half. Uh, so that's sort of out there as, as identifiable funding. The place where this, I think, is, is <coughs> hitting the road is in the states and, and the localities where um, one of the things I think we, we dealt with in our first Recovery Act report is that uh, a lot of states don't even have the financial systems built to track the money separately. So how they're going to do that and, and how that's going to play out in the longer term, I think, is, is an, an important thing to keep an eye on because I'm not sure the investment in, in doing it at the ideal state that the bill seems to project doing it today uh, really makes much sense in the longer term. Uh, one area that we've been trying to, to give some real um, uh, attention to in terms of, I won't use the, the, the lobbying word exactly, but because we have had these um, conference calls with the state and local audit community and others, 
Um, we have uh, come to understand that the state auditors, which in many states are an, are an important player here, got no money out of this bill at all. And they were all, because of, of state budgets being cut, they were all under considerable pressure and cutting back in their activities. So one of the things that we are uh, trying to uh, facilitate discussions about is whether states can be given a little more flexibility in terms of how they use some of these funds so that they can account for their accountability locally where the people know the most about it. We are relying very heavily on the state auditors as we go into the states we're in uh, because they know the players and they know the systems. Um, and so that's an important element of this. At the end of the day, this will be one of the more expensive accountability projects probably ever funded. Brian, what about that at the state level? Yeah, I agree with everything Nancy said. Um, from the state level, this has been a very big issue of late, dealing with administrative costs, the cost of reporting and everything. Uh, OMB issued a guidance, I believe it was on May 11th, trying to keep all my dates straight, dealing with the administrative costs issue for states, and basically permitting uh, states to use 0.5% of stimulus dollars going down towards them for administrative costs and everything. Um, Right now, there's a lot of effort in trying to understand how all that will be reported, uh, how the states will be refunded for that. Um, we actually just had a conference call this afternoon uh, with OMB and HHS dealing with the administrative costs issue and the 0.5% that states are permitted to expend on administrative costs. But um, yeah, the major concern for states, I mean, a lot of states, because over the past year, states have done the layoffs, they've done the mandatory furloughs and everything, and this has typically affected all agencies and states. Uh, so the accounting departments, the auditors, the comptrollers, you know, they haven't been spared from these cutbacks. So a lot of these state agencies, they're dealing with less people in their auditor's office already, and then they're having additional reporting requirements that are sometimes, you know, almost doubling their work and everything. So it's trying to figure out how to comply with these additional requirements with less people and everything. Um, Still uncertain how much it's actually going to cost. Uh, I would say for most states, it's going to be more than 0.5% of their money going towards the states. Of course, there's also the element of there's some hesitancy a lot of times to even spend any of the stimulus money on uh, administrative costs and everything because politically, you know, you want to get the money out and everything. So uh, the auditing community is really being stretched at the state level and everything. So uh, it'll be a, it's a big issue for states going forward here. Representative Towns introduced legislation that made it through the House, kind of dealing with this issue a little bit. Uh, it's in the Senate right now. I don't think it's had a hearing yet in the Senate, but um, there might be some movement going forward and kind of trying to possibly provide states a little bit more flexibility with the administrative costs issue. But between our members and the auditors and states in general, I say it's one of the top two or three issues for states right now is trying to deal with all the costs for the reporting requirements. Getting back to measurement, there's a lot of, of talk about the, the issue of how many jobs have been created as the, the critical measure. Are there other measures that you think are, are extremely important for us to keep our eye on um, in terms of measuring the effectiveness of, of the Recovery Act? Greg? Well, certainly in the, as I tried to indicate earlier, I, I guess to, in, in the energy field, there are a number of factors that we, we are intending to look at, um, including uh, uh, new starts in terms of uh, technology, uh, energy savings resulting from the weatherization program. There's a substantial amount of money that is to be spent from the uh, Recovery Act on uh, revamping uh, uh, federal buildings. And these are actually fairly measurable. Now, they, 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 you know, they're not very sophisticated in terms of program evaluation, and uh, they may not give uh, people who are really professional program evaluators a great deal of satisfaction at the end of the day, but I think they, there is the potential there to get some sense to have your finger on the pulse of, of aspects of the program where there are measurable criteria that uh, I think will be very helpful at the end, at the end of the day. Nancy, what do you think? Um, well, clearly there needs to be other measures because I think we're rather pessimistic that, that there will ever be able to be a definitive causal connection between the stimulus bill and job creation. Uh, there are so many variables, there's so many st stimulative effects that go to secondary and, th and tertiary uh, job creation. Um, I think there, the other thing we need to remember is this stimulus bill is not occurring entirely in a vacuum. There is another fairly large program called TARP that is intended to, that we also, by the way, have a 60-day reporting requirement about. 
um, that is intended to deal with the situation in the financial um, uh, markets. And to the extent that is successful and it relieves the pressure on the credit system so that small businesses can begin to get back in business again and so forth from the uh, available resources that, that clearly the banks have or Goldman Sachs wouldn't have made $3 billion in the first quarter of the year. Um, I think if we can begin to free that money up, that will have an effect too. Now that will further complicate assigning this job was created because of the stimulus bill and this job was created because credit was relieved. But if we're lucky as a nation, this will begin to turn around and then we can begin to focus evaluatively on specific programs like Greg was talking about and see if we can tease apart where the growth or, or improvement or innovation or whatever in all of those um, hundreds of programs have come from. You brought up the very good point that it's going to be a very difficult to disentangle the various causes of creating jobs or losing jobs. Um, Scott, what do you think? Uh, are there, is, it, is it going to be even possible to, to attribute jobs to s simply the Recovery Act as opposed to a more general funding? Uh, I'm, I'm sort of I'm interested in the, the concept of the stratified sampling that, that, that Joe mentioned because I think what you're probably going to get in reality is lots and lots of anecdotes and press releases. <laughs> you will not have any real data. And, and, and a lot of this is I'm giving, giving, giving me flashbacks because for, for years uh, NASA had uh, tried to argue that, uh, you know, if you put a certain amount of money into NASA, there's sort of a, a, a multiplier effect that comes out. You put $1 in, you get $6 back over long-term R&D. Uh, and, and I've found generally the economic uh, rationale used in a lot of those analyses is to be very unconvincing. Uh, that uh, NASA spending has a uh, has a stimulative effect, pretty much like every other form of government spending. So if you measure dollars actually going out, um, not just obligated but actually costed onto contracts, you'll be able to get a gross measure of the employment effect of of putting that money out there. Uh, the problem is is that because of all these other confounding effects with TARP and and uh, other uh, normal government spending that will be very, very difficult to tease out. I think people will spend a lot of time doing that, come up with a pile of anecdotes, but won't have anything that would be really terribly analytically convincing. Therefore, I think attention ought to be spent instead um, on measures to improve, you know, the efficiency of the performance of the missions the agencies are asked to do. Uh, again, something that may be politically unrealistic, but I would be really interested after people get past uh, October. Uh, and as the states have their various problems, it's whether or not there could be an amendment that would relax uh, the requirement on no commingling of funds. Uh, I think that if you did if you did that one thing uh, at the expense of what might might consider to be accountability, I think you would drastically lower the transaction costs uh, for being able to comply at both the state and federal level, and you could get people more focused, uh, you know, on doing the missions that the, the public has asked them to do. We have good representation of the R&D community here with uh, Greg and Scott at the table. Do these sectors need special, uh, different type of approach in terms of evaluation? Greg? Well, I, I, I think they do. And I, by the way, for those of you who don't know, and many of you may know, the Department of Energy, more than anything else, is really an, a science agency. We uh, own and operate uh, 16 or 17 national laboratories, three defense the weapons laboratories, and a, and a series of, of general science laboratories. And we are the largest underwriter of basic science uh, in the United States. So we are a science, a science agency. And the, the, the most uh, difficult, thorniest issue that I deal with in terms of, of the, the people in the science arena is their contention that you cannot measure uh, progress in, in science. They, they, they give me a very difficult time in coming up with measures, quantifiable measures, that we can use, especially in basic research. And I've come to conclude that they are likely right. So I don't have a very satisfactory answer. I think there are measures that need to be implemented, uh, I think, but I think it's extremely difficult, especially in the basic sciences. I think Joe alluded to this uh, in his earlier comments. There are some extremely diff difficult uh, phenomena in trying to measure basic science and the success in basic science. The way we could kind of just yeah. respond, I was very impressed when uh, the Government Performance Results Act came in and that the National Science Foundation decided to use a qualitative assessment system. Uh, they start with a three-point scale. Are we funding trash here with our money? <laughs> Are we funding good, respectable research? Would be the second point on a three-point scale. 
or is this really path-breaking stuff? Uh, and uh, they said, this is kind of boring. We're never going to be on the bottom level. We'll always be funding at least respectable research. So then they went to a two-point scale. But what they do, <laughs> but what they do though, they have their committees of visitors, and I'm five years out of date, but I expect this still now, that, that the committees of visitors are fueled up with any amount of information on what's been going on, and they render a judgment, program area by program area, within uh, these different basic science like astronomy, mathematics, physics, whatever they have. Uh, it, are they funding things that are really important, path-breaking stuff, or is it just boring, high-quality research? You know, that, that's the issue. That was the issue for uh, the National Science Foundation. It's a qualitative assessment system. Uh, it's uh, based on just the way we do accreditation of schools, or programs, etc. Wise people go in and take a look. They're fueled up with a lot of information, but in the end, they make a qualitative judgment uh, as to whether something is here or here. You can have 17-point scales. I don't care. But, but, well, I don't want to belabor that. I want to just squeeze in that if we had random sample anecdotes so that we really knew what was happening, and I knew that people are being housed now that would have been on the street, and I knew that they fixed the intersection of Route 50 and Courthouse Road, which has been waiting 100 years. <laughs> and they fixed the intersection of Washington Boulevard and Columbia Pike, where one was going to fall down on the other. And nobody could get the resources together. And all of a sudden, so I just think that this sampling strategy, telling narrative, if you, if you read the GAO uh, manual on case studies, it says the following. It's engraved in my mind. <laughs> Case studies provide a comprehensive understanding of what happened and why. You get so much rich information that you can, you can understand what the causal mechanisms were that were at work. And you can rule out the, uh, you know, the potential confounding factors and so forth because you get to see from a good case study uh, I saw one on the Harlem Valley Psychiatric Center, and it moved from being one of those state mental hospitals that you fear to being primarily outpatient. And the, it was a book. The whole book is one case study, and it shows you how somebody locked in his office, <laughs> not a really dramatic guy, changed the mental health system in the area of the state he was responsible for. Uh, you get to see from a good case study what was happening and why <laughs> certain outcomes occurred. And it, you could have, you know, hundreds of these if you wanted. <laughs> that sounds like a okay. good employment for graduate students. <laughs> right. Put them to work. They have to eat too. <laughs> right. <laughs> Scott, other uh, thoughts on... Well, uh, I, I just wanted to add, add one point. I mean, it, it's, it's exactly right about you get a bunch of smart people in uh, and you do peer review on, on science and you let them bang off of each other and argue and fight and there's a richness there that really can't be duplicated by other sort of, you know, simple metrics. Uh, the one thing I just wanted to add was the idea of, of you need to do this in time series. That is, you want to have good peer review and arguments for the particular decisions in allocating funds each year, to making sure you're funding, you know, what seem to be the best and most reasonable things. But then you also want to be able to look forward to uh, what uh, in the NASA world we would do called decadal surveys. That we would, every 10 years we would have people say, what are the big questions in astronomy? And they come up with a big list. And okay, we're going to build the Hubble Space Telescope next. That's our top priority. Or we're going to build the James Webb Space Telescope next. And here's a bunch of other sub pieces. And then there's a retrospective look uh, that goes on and says, okay, where did some of these uh, inventions or innovations or pathbreaking work come from? And what happens when you look back uh, is you often find unexpected degrees of interdependence and relationship, which leads you to be a lot more humble about dumping all of your money into, say, one area of, of R&D. Uh, in particular, um, uh, comments we'd had with the, um, uh, the bio, uh, bio, uh, biological 
uh, folks. Uh, NIH, which has, of course, gone a dramatic increase over the last several years, because, of course, you know, finding a cure for cancer is very politically popular, and there's lots of useful things to do. But some of the more path-breaking uh, work and contributions to uh, medical research have come, say, in the physics areas, MRIs, CAT scans, all those sorts of things, which are not classical uh, medical research areas, but they're interdisciplinary outcomes. Uh, some of the technology that I mean, computer programming that was used to uh, help uh, fix some of the Hubble images, which initially were blurry before we sent astronauts up to fix it, uh, some of that uh, image processing uh, software that came back was then later repurposed uh, for improving a screening of breast cancer mammograms. Um, again, it, these strange connections that come up that you really have a hard time predicting a priori. So when doing these kinds of measures, uh, pay attention to differences in time. Look forward, argue about what the most important questions are, look backwards, and um, maybe rededicate oneself to having kind of a balanced portfolio of your activities, of diversification, if you will, uh, because predicting innovation uh, on any sort of uh, uh, linear strategy is likely to fail. Okay. In, after one more question, I would like to turn to the audience and have you think of questions you would like the panel to address. So start thinking while I ask my last question, because as someone, somebody who teaches students about measurement, validity, and reliability, I have to ask them one last question about who's paying attention and verifying, validating uh, the data that we're going to be getting back from the, uh, the contractors. I'm going to ask Nancy at the federal level and Brian at the state level. So who, who's minding the store here in terms of validity and reliability of the data? Well, since none of the data are in yet, we're, that's, it's a little premature to ask that question. Uh, we have been out in the states that we've been, been studying asking uh, what systems the states are planning to put into um, effect to do that. And um, by and large, I think, I think Brian would agree where the states are focused on that to some extent. Uh, to the extent the, program, the, the data relate to specific uh, federal programs, and I think it's important to understand an awful lot of this money is just being pumped through existing programs, okay? So there already are processes for reporting information. And that information comes back to the, to the departments as well as, as, as to recovery.gov or wherever else it ends up. Um, I think it's an important question. I think it's going to be really messy for the first six months or so. Um, but I think a lot of people are paying attention to the issue. Brian? Yeah, I'd really echo what Nancy said. Uh, almost like you're reading my talking points here for this question. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, for the state level, it really is a work in progress right now. The systems are just being created right now. Uh, OMB just came out with their latest round of reporting guidance, I guess, the end of June sometime and everything. So 22nd. 22nd, there you go. So states are now dealing with that, trying to implement it and everything. Um, and it really does, you know, it really does depend on which program you're talking about. The programs are already in existence. State aren't, states aren't nearly as worried about it as they need to try and do the tracking and everything because it kind of just trying to add an extra layer on there, but there's already systems in place. Uh, some of the new programs are going to be a lot more problematic to do all the tracking and everything. Um, you know, depending, specifically with the contractors, it kind of depends, I guess, what level of the food chain they are. If they're a sub-recipient, uh, the Recovery Act requires uh, additional information, so you will be seeing, you know, what the project was intended for, how much money was spent and everything, and the name of the company and stuff like that. Uh, so it really does differ. Uh, I mean, I think doing the evaluation and trying to verify all the information and everything, there's going to be a lot of different players involved with it. It's going to be the state agencies. It's going to be the state IGs. It'll be the Federal Recovery Board. Or it'll be GAO. Um, so there's going to be a lot of different people looking at it. Uh, I think that's probably good for the most part. It's probably going to create confusion a lot of times, too, trying to figure out who's responsible for what and who's keeping an eye on what. But um, there are, all, are, you know, large number of parties involved dealing with the tracking and everything, and there will be a high level of reporting requirements involved. So I guess we're reassured that there are going to be so many different entities that are going to be involved in verifying validity and reliability, well, I think. Well, I, you know, I would add, it, it, if any of you have not actually read the June 22nd document, it's a good thing to put yourself to sleep with. But um, on the other hand, it is an, an, an amazingly... Uh, strong effort to try to create a situation in which there might possibly be some consistency in reporting information across states, across programs, and so forth. 
it, it's a level of detail that in, in my whole career, I don't think I've ever seen the federal government as the whole of the federal government, not one agency might try to do it, but the federal government as a whole to lay down a set of ground rules. The, the weakness of it is, of course, is you can't predict um, what you're going to need to report on every single little detail about every single little thing. But it was a good, strong, honest, pretty well thought out effort that will probably be refined over time as we see the first data and look at it. Um, being specifically responsible in statute, which we take at GAO very seriously, um, to comment on these recipient reports. Um, we note that they were sensible enough not to drive that level of reporting down to the subrecipients. So at some point, the specific information about how this data, or how this money is being used will peter out, if you will. But that's probably a good thing too, because I'm not sure that that, that kind of demand uh, wouldn't blow up the cost of accountability to a point where we would all end up being embarrassed five years from now. So I would just like to point out, there are a lot of people from OMB here that they can take back this compliment from GAO. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, OMB. Uh, Brian? Um, yeah, Nancy, you mentioned that uh, guidance would likely be refined over time and everything. I think that's kind of one of the concerns for states going forward here is, you know, states are starting to figure out how to implement the June 22nd guidance and everything, and so now they're looking at creating the systems to be able to handle all the requirements and everything, but if that gets changed over time, that's a concern for states. I mean, if they're going out and having to spend money to create these new systems, and you know, six, seven months down the road, if there is additional guidance kind of changing what's required or if additional information is required, kind of try and have to recreate their system. So um, from the state side, I mean, there's definitely hopeful that the guidance, you know, won't be too much refinement of it. Obviously, there's going to be some changes as we go along here and everything. Um, you know, they're working on frequently asked questions document right now, try to answer some of the questions and everything. But uh, states are hopeful it's not going to be a complete overhaul of what's being reported, required right now. Thank you. you. Okay. You know, as, as someone who had to sort of put together some FAQs for press as well, um, you know, I think coming October, you can almost predict the stories that mm -hmm. you're going to get because the data from contractors is going, going directly into the database. The agencies will not necessarily have seen that beforehand. They'll have their own records, their own thoughts about what it is, and there's going to be these gaps, and you're trying to figure out. And so, you know, as, as sure as the sun's going to rise, there's going to be a series of press stories about, you know, industry has said this, agencies said that, back and forth. And so having some uh, thought as to the, the press guidance and the FAQs beforehand and that there is going to be a process for adjudicating these things and try to establish the idea that, that, that the VNV is going to be rough and that it is going to be a part of a normal process is really going to be important almost to prepare people for that gap because because the contractors are not going through the agencies but are going you know direct in their reporting um, it's almost inevitable that 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 will show up so thinking toward toward fall press guidance would probably be a good idea. Okay, audience. Right down here, Bill. Thoughtful comments about our current about our uh, current situation. I just have a quick question, asking you to reflect back. Um, if you had been uh, powerful members of the House Senate Conference Committee, uh, writing the Stimulus Recovery Act a few months ago. Um, and could have had specific changes in the legislation that would have affected evaluation. Uh, what particular things, if you could have dictated a few cl uh, pivotal clauses in that legislation, would you have made uh, retroactively, retrospectively, in this legislation to improve evaluation effectiveness? Joe? Well, we did write some w quick short words in a couple of statutes many years ago. Trying to do policy analysis, you don't want to know what the existing programs are accomplishing. So you give the secretary the right to take up to one half of one percent or it could be up to 0 0.01 percent or whatever. So, but up to, but you may take that just off the top and use it for evaluation of the programs, and, and so, and we put in the Public Health Service Act also up to 1% of the funds may be taken by the secretary and used, and naturally some of it is spent by the public health people, not all in the office of the secretary. But if you say up to 1% or up to a half percent or up to 0.1% of the funds, 
may be taken off the top and used for evaluation, and evaluation is an undefined term, uh, that means you're able to do analytical work uh, of some uh, scale, uh, you know, and you could do it state by state or whatever. I mean, you could have an analytic capacity. You could have restoration of some of these <laughs> cuts in these audit offices and whatever, because auditing is evaluation and everything's evaluation, and I mean, it all blends together. Uh, so. I mean, I would put in those few words, and that maybe isn't the only set aside we've heard today about how people need money to run <laughs> the programs, you know, and that the 0.5% for administrative costs probably isn't going to do it. Uh, and wouldn't you like these things to be run in a sensible way so we're getting uh, more out of them? You know, yes, we would. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but we, we hobble the managers. Uh, if they only have half the staff or a tenth of the staff they should to run a decent uh, program. So, so I would think some ability to have administrative set-asides, including for analytical purposes. Evaluation set-asides. Yep. Any others, ideas? Well, I'll take a parochial view. I really wish we could have talked them out of the 60-day thing. <laughs> um, and I say that for those of you who know GAO, the average engagement in GAO runs six to nine months. Uh, that's way down from where it was 15 years ago. Where an, a, a standard length of time would have been more like a year, a year and a half. Um, that's a reasonable time to plan a reasonable set of researchable questions and a reasonable set of data collection strategies and a reasonable set of thought process going into how you collect the data. The 60-day report cycle has driven us into what at best is a qualitative um, auditing cycle where our program teams spend, we, it, we get a report out the door. In the next five working days, the program teams say, okay, what questions are we going to ask the states in the next 60-day uh, effort? We don't take the time to refine those questions in a way that that you could bring them down to close-ended kinds of questions or bring them down to something that you've actually given a little bit of more thought to. And we throw our folks out in the field. They collect all this information. We are blessed that we have a, a, a data collection application that we can put up over a weekend to get those, get a, a tool out there for people to write up their interview write-ups and get the stuff into the system. And then the people at this end spend a lot of time doing qualitative data analysis, and I don't want to look at those work papers. I mean, it's, it's the, the pace of it, aside from the travel schedule for the people involved out in the states, is just taking away the time we need, in my view, to give thought to what we're doing and how we're doing it and how we're going to evaluate this going forward. I don't see any let up from that. I think we are going to begin to be much more selective in what we cover in each of these reports so that we can buy ourselves some time to look at some of these bigger issues in the longer term way. We're doing, trying to do good coordination with the IG community so that we're not looking at the same stuff they're looking at and so forth. But that kind of, the, the Congress got that 60-day thing into their head when they did TARP, and they just, they just sort of like it now, right? They can get us up there for hearings and, and all that kind of thing. But institutionally, it's killing our organization. I mean, our, our people are, are really just, they can't, we can't sustain this. I, I don't know where it's going to go, but, so I'm just selfish about it. I wish we could get rid of that requirement. Brian, thoughts? From a state perspective, I think there's kind of two things. One is I think a lot of states wish that there would have been money included specific for administrative and reporting costs. I mean, that's already kind of been discussed. Uh, I think the other concern is kind of a timeline issue for states. Uh, so when the quarter ends on September 30th uh, for that quarter and everything, states will have to report by October 10th all spending through September 30th. So states basically have 10 days to close out their books and get all the information compiled and everything. Um, that's a lot faster than the states are used to being able to compile it. Uh, there's concerns about the quality of the data in that short period of being able to put it together and everything. It's not so much that states aren't going to be prepared by October. I think, you know, even if the data would only have to be through the end of August, then you would have a little over a month to kind of work on the data, collect the data, refine it, make sure, you know, it's accurate and everything else. So it's going to be a really difficult challenge for states to try to, you know, compile all the reports, go through, check them for accuracy and everything in that period. Um, states will have to submit the reports by October 10th. I think there's a 
between October 10th and October 21st is a period where states can refine the reports and everything. But uh, even through that period, I mean, it's going to be difficult for states that really have thorough, you know, completely accurate reports. Uh, the next time they do reporting in the next quarter, states will be able to update the numbers and everything, so that will help. But for the first go-around, it's going to be really difficult for states to have all their information compiled and everything by October 10th. Okay. I think there, I had somebody up here, had it, over here. Yeah, I'm thinking about the financial meltdown that we're in right now and the uh, sort of contribution, if you can say, of the omission of federal agencies to look at these exotic financial instruments. And so as you're talking, I get the sense that there's this tremendous redundancy that people are going to be looking at where the money's going from the federal level, state level, local level. But are there sort of unexplored corners or areas that are not being looked at where we're potentially going to see some blow up you know a couple of years down where somebody says the federal government was not paying attention not in my reading of the statute <laughs> <laughs> my reading is that it's much too micro <laughs> and does go into all those corners it's kind of boring well uh, again from my point of view the stimulus is only one of the things going on in the world and um, We've, we've been, uh, we issued a report on the lack of regulation of derivatives in 1990, where was I? I was in GGD, 1996, 97. Um, it was a terribly difficult report to get out of the office because nobody would looked at the question before. So we, t we try to keep our eye on this other stuff going on. But one of the things I have learned in my government career as an oversight or evaluation sort of person is that the, the, the population of this country is infinitely clever in figuring out way, ways to, to uh, do things that we all would rather they didn't do, and all we can do is keep trying. Anyone else? Okay, over here, down here. As someone who tracks and analyzes uh, tax, economic, and revenue trends, I'd like to know if you think the stimulus is really going to help the states cl uh, close their budget short shortfalls. Yeah, I think the stimulus definitely, I think help is the right word there. Stimulus will definitely help states close the shortfall. Uh, stimulus alone isn't going to be enough for states to close their shortfalls. Um, even since, you know, the stimulus passed in February, the size of state shortfalls has increased for a lot of states. Basically, revenue keeps on coming down. Uh, the April tax collections came in lower than projected for almost all states. So basically, states had already ramped down their revenue projections, and the April collections came in even below that. So uh, states are still dealing with tremendous revenue shortfalls going on. Uh, if there hadn't been a stimulus, it would have been catastrophic for states. I mean, you really would have seen a lot more draconian cuts. So going forward from here, um, next year, we're still expecting most st states that have to cut their budgets. You're still going to see reductions in spending. Um, you'll still see states using the rainy day funds and balances. Some states are going to have to examine tax and fee increases because they've already cut to such a level and everything. But if there wasn't any stimulus, I mean, that would have been you know, a lot worse and a lot more drastic and everything. So it really has been helpful. It's just that, you know, from a state's perspective, the revenue just keeps on declining so much that it's not going to be a loan to be enough to close out the shortfalls. And, I think another concern for states going forward, too, is that state revenues typically lag in recovering after the national economy. So basically, uh, the recession ends in the third quarter of this year, like a lot of economists are predicting. Typically, state revenues take at least two years to recover after that. So a concern for states going forward here is, you know, what happens when the stimulus money runs out? If revenues aren't back to normal levels, are we going to have to do really drastic cuts a couple years down the road? One more question. Let's see. I can't really see, but back there. Uh, what is the uh, potential impact of the stimulus program on the universities, especially the George Washington University, which is so close to uh, the White House and Congress, from the standpoint of <laughs> academic programs, uh, budget, and campus construction? Thank you. Uh, what is the impact of the stimulus on uh, universities? Or George Washington University in particular? Yeah. I don't think we, there is any. <laughs> I'll look to Dean Barrett. <laughs> Do you have an answer? Down here, please. 
think somewhat the same as Kathy, not a huge impact. We didn't have a big shovel-ready construction project, <laughs> and that would have been good. That would have been good. We do have a number of our scientists lined up to get possible extra money from NIH and NSF, uh, DOE, so we do think that some money is going to come in from there. Um, we hope that the loan money will still be there for the students. Um, so the fact that there's been attention to those issues is very good because us and our students need that for us to keep coming. Not much more yet. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Barrett. I would also like to thank the, the panel. Uh, thank you very much, Brian, Joe, Greg, Nancy, and Scott. Thank you.